Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we are so excited to host uh, Dr. Harvey Kleiman, Yale's renowned MD, PhD, placental pathologist, researcher, and one of the leading um, placental experts in the entire world. Uh, and we are joined tonight by um, a couple of our push change makers, Erica Bailey and Angelica Kovac. And we also, and I'm Samantha Banerjee, Executive Director of PUSH. Um, and uh, we also are all uh, members of the Measure the Placenta team. Um, so yeah, let's do, let's do some quick in introductions. I guess, Harvey, do you wanna start? Sure, so I'm Harvey Kleiman. I'm an MD, PhD physician scientist at the Yale University School of Medicine in the Department of Obstetrics, Gynecology and Reproductive Sciences. I do research on infertility and pregnancy. I specifically look at the placenta both as a research tool and also as a way to figure out why uh, families have pregnancy losses. Thank you, Harvey. Um, and we're, we're so lucky to have you at our disposal and, and Harvey has been instrumental in uh, for many of the families at PUSH, finding answers as to why our babies were born still um, and to helping empower us in future pregnancies to advocate for ourselves. Um, so thank you, Harvey, for everything you do. Uh, Erica, do you want to go next? Sure. <clears throat> I'm Erica Bailey, and I am a wasp mom because my firstborn son was born still after a perfect 39 week pregnancy in 2020 because he had an undetected small placenta because placentas aren't measured in pregnancy. And I also have a live son that was born about a year later. And I'm working with Measure the Placenta because placenta should be measured for every single pregnancy regardless of risk because like many others on here and across the world, I was not high risk until my son died. Thank you, Erica, for sharing. And thank you for all you do to advocate in Rome's honor. Um, Angelica, do you wanna go next? And you are muted. Sure. <laughs> my name is Angelica Kovach. Um, I am a mother of three. I have a living daughter who is four years old. Um, I also have um, two sons who we lost uh, one to stillbirth. So this is my little guy. This is Ezra. He was still born at um, 33 weeks and five des days gestation to um, multiple, at least several days of umbilical cord compression. Um, and then in February, on February 15th, we lost another little boy um, whom we named Fletcher uh, at 14 weeks uh, to miscarriage. And he was uh, just, it was just, genetic abnormalities, but Dr. Kleiman has been very kind in, in helping us to determine what happened to both of our boys. Thank you for sharing, Angelica, and thank you so much again for all you do. Um, in both of your son's names, you've been a huge, huge part of our PUSH team, and, um, and you too, Erica, and, and you too, Harvey, so uh, we're very really excited to have, have this for here tonight. Um, like Erica and Angelica, I'm also a lost mom. My uh, daughter, Alana, was born still two days before her due date in 2013. Um, after a totally normal and healthy pregnancy, we went to the hospital in labor only to find out she no longer had a heartbeat. Uh, and I always say, we did not know this could even happen in this day and age. We especially did not know it could happen to us, uh, to people who had excellent medical care in the United States. Um, and we were just shocked and appalled to learn the scale of this problem that stillbirth uh, to this day is claiming the lives of more children in the United States than prematurity, SIDS, car accidents, drowning, guns, fire, poison, flu, and listeria combined. It's actually three times as many child deaths up to age 14 according to CDC data. And yet very little is being done to address this problem um, by our leaders in medicine and government and public health um, anywhere. And so we founded PUSH um, and, and joined forces with the Measure the Placenta team and with many of our partners across um, the stillbirth prevention and maternal health field, including Count the Kicks, um, which Erica is a, an ambassador for. And we have just been doing everything that we can as parents and as advocates to try to push for change because every 23 minutes in this country, a baby is dying. And um, in the second half of pregnancy, you know, 
uh, 80% of those pregnancies, moms are starting their first appointment with zero risk factors for stillbirth. So these are happening in healthy, low risk pregnancies. Um, and, and nothing is, has been being done to stop it. I mean, it's been, it's been decades. And I think, I think it, we'd also be remiss not to mention, especially during Black Maternal Health Week, that there are huge racial disparities in, uh, in all pregnancy outcomes, but it's also uh, including stillbirth. Um, so Black moms are more than twice as likely to have a stillbirth compared to um, white women. Um, black moms uh, account for 30, almost 30% of stillbirths, even though they only make up 13% of the population. And as we've seen in other, um, in other areas of, of maternal health and, and pregnancy outcomes, you know, uh, education, wealth, and access to care do not improve outcomes for black moms the way that they do for other races. And that points to a very clear explanation of systemic structural racism and implicit bias in our medical system um, that, is, that is likely the root cause of this problem. So um, something really, really important for us to address. And it's been super exciting this week to see all of our partners across the maternal health space um, sharing their experiences um, and just you know really being very authentic and, and getting their lived experiences out there so that our providers and our government leaders can hear um, what parents are actually going through because I think it's very different than what most people think is what think is going on, right? So I know I mentioned um, the, that unfortunately there's a baby being born still every 23 minutes in the US. Um, and I looked up while we were doing introductions, we have a new tool on our website, pushpregnancy.org slash counter um, called our stillbirth counter. And you could put in the date and time of any, um, any time and it will calculate for you uh, approximately how many babies have been born still and how, what and how many of those likely could have been saved if we were doing more to try. So the last time that we were on a Facebook Live with Dr. Harvey was January 12th at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. So I put that in as the date and time. And according to our calculations, 5,694 babies have been born still since the last time mm -hmm. uh, we went live on Facebook with Dr. Harvey. And between around 1,400 to 4,200 of those deaths could potentially have been prevented. So those numbers are pretty staggering. Um, and actually, the you might hear it in the background, uh, the counter is still is, is counting down to, to the next the next loss that's going to happen. Um, and you know it's already been a few minutes, so now we're down to 18 minutes. So uh, when you hear a, a flat loin noise in the background, um, you know, I think it's just so important for us to keep that front of mind, right? This is an urgent problem. There are babies dying every moment in this country and we could be doing something about it and we're not. And we're especially not doing something about it when it comes to um, marginalized communities and to black families in particular. And this is, this is a huge issue and it needs to be a priority in everyone's mind. And I, I'm gonna leave the counter running just to keep that going. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but you never know who's watching, right? Um, okay, so let's jump into the topic for tonight. So I think uh, what we actually titled this, uh, this chat tonight is, what is not being done in the US to monitor your baby's placenta, which is the most vital organ for your baby's survival during pregnancy. So Harvey, please tell us, number one, what is the placenta? Why is it important? And what aren't we monitoring about it in a, in a standard pregnancy today? Well, Samantha, you've really concisely summarized it. So thank you for that. Uh, basically the placenta is part of the fetus, the baby. And one of the things that people get confused about is they think a baby is born and then out comes mom's placenta. It's not mom's placenta. It actually belongs to the baby. Uh, there are a couple of ways to think about it. You can think of the placenta as the roots of the tree. So you would never consider the roots part of the dirt, right? It's the part of the tree that's going into the soil. And that's how the tree survives by getting water and nutrients from the soil into the tree. It's even more um, you know, precarious for a fetus inside of a uterus. There's only one way it can survive, only one. It's 100% dependent on its placenta. Without the placenta, there is no pregnancy. In fact, you can have a pregnancy with a placenta only and no fetus, but not the other way around. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are pregnancies where it's just the placenta and that's still a pregnancy. 
right? Because the placenta is what makes a pregnancy. So, you know, this fetus is like in space. I think, you know, think of Apollo 13 when those three astronauts were coming back and they were barely able to survive and they had to survive on whatever oxygen was there and power and things like that. That fetus is 100% dependent on its placenta. So there's a very simple saying I have behind every healthy baby is a healthy placenta. And the converse is sadly true. When the placenta is not healthy, that's very dangerous for the fetus. And if it's really problematic, the placenta, then the fetus will die. And that's what a stillbirth is. So the placenta is absolutely critical. There, there's just no question about it. And in fact, in all studies that have looked at causes of stillbirth, the number one place to look for the explanation is the placenta. Part of the reason is that right now, ultrasound is so accurate, even starting at the 20 week ultrasound, that uh, obstetricians and maternal fetal medicine specialists really can diagnose almost all the fetal abnormalities that might exist. And there are certainly a lot of them. However, even if a fetus has severe abnormalities, is missing its lungs, has severe cardiac problem, is missing a kidney, has things that it needs to do, you know, surgery will need to be done as soon as that baby is born, if it survives to birth, it still is completely supported by its placenta. So it actually, even though it has all those problems, it doesn't show up as a problem for the pregnancy. It's only the placenta that leads to a problem. Now, when you look at what are the different causes of stillbirth, the number one cause is a small placenta. A placenta that's too small is like having a little lawnmower engine and a big truck. And at some point, that little lawnmower engine cannot get the truck up the hill. And every day that goes by in the pregnancy as the fetus tries to get bigger and bigger, that very small placenta becomes more and more problematic. And that's why it's so critical, in my opinion, and many opinions of people who are on this call, is we just have a simple request, measure the placenta, right? I mean, if you have a child or just remember back to your childhood, the first thing a pediatrician does is weigh the child when they come into the doctor's office. That is sort of the most best way to get an overall measure of the health of that child. Likewise, looking at the size of the placenta, since the pregnancy is completely dependent on the placenta, measuring the size of the placenta is a very quick snapshot to answer a simple question. Is there enough horsepower, engine power to keep that you know, baby alive inside of the mother's uterus? So that's my overview, and I'd be happy to you know, give more details as we get into it, but that's the reason the placenta is so critical. It's so critical to measure it. And the uh, fetus is 100% dependent on the health and well being of its placenta. So, Harvey, tell us about like what are some of the things that can go wrong in the, in the placenta? I know we talked about size, right? And that's, that's an, an easy one um, to measure and detect. Um, and we can talk more about that in a little bit. But I'm, I'm curious um, if you could explain some of the other issues that people run into. Like, I'm sure people have heard the terms like placental insufficiency thrown around, um, you know, placental abruption. You know, can you explain what those are for anyone who's not familiar? Sure. So let's just walk through the major causes of stillbirth. And they're virtually all related to the placenta, of course, as I just said. So the number one, and if we Let's just define stillbirth. Stillbirth is a pregnancy loss, and this is in our country. It's different in other countries. In our country, it's defined as a loss that happens at 20 weeks or beyond. So in that time period of 20 weeks and beyond, about 33% of losses are due to a small placenta. Yeah. About 30%, which is another big piece, is due to some intrinsic genetic abnormality not necessarily a small placenta, but something is not functioning correctly in the placenta. And that shows up as a genetic abnormality. So that together is over 60%. The next big piece of the pie, which is much smaller than those two together, are cord accidents. Now that's probably something that people hear about a lot because I think that of all the different types of 
causes. That is, in my mind, one of the most tragic because everything is perfect right up until the time there's a court accident. It's very difficult to predict it. It's out of the blue. The mother may not really even notice anything. She might have an experience where there's a sudden flurry of activity, increased activity, and she may even say, wow, you know, my baby's really going crazy right now. And on, you know, the mother doesn't understand that that's actually a fetus that's struggling because it's, the cord is being compressed. Compressing the umbilical cord is like a scuba diver and somebody's clamping the hose between the gas tank and the mass, right? That scuba diver cannot survive without that gas from the tank. Likewise, the fetus cannot survive without that umbilical cord sending blood from the body of the fetus to its placenta to get oxygen. So that's about 15% of the time. The other causes which are 5% and lower are abruptions, which is a complete separation of the placenta. That happens sometimes when women have hypertension. There are uh, infections that can happen. Uh, something that is even rarer than those, but it's, a, again, a very sad thing, it's sort of related to a cord accident, is when some of the, think of the roots of the tree I was telling you, some of the blood vessels in the placenta carrying the fetal blood actually rupture, and the blood from the fetus goes into the mother's circulation. Of course, the mother has no idea this is happening. And just to give you a measure for anybody listening to this, you might ask yourself, well, how much blood does a newborn baby have total in its entire circulation? So I have to do this metrically. Um, a typical baby born is maybe seven and a half pounds. That's about three to three and a half kilograms. That baby has 250 mLs of blood. So if you look at a little water bottle that has the typical pint size of 500 mLs, that's half of that bottle. That's a very small amount of blood. It's very easy to lose half the blood. And mm -hmm. the mother would never know about it. It's not going to affect her whatsoever. And from the fetus's point of view, it's bleeding to death. It just goes to sleep, all right? It's not going to even have increased kick counts. There's going to be no motion. The first thing that the mother will notice, if she notices anything, is decreased fetal movement. And that can happen pretty quickly. She might just assume that her baby's asleep, right? And not even realize that that's happened. So those are the main things. The last I'll talk about because I think there are people interested in COVID and I'll just sort of transition to COVID if people are interested in that. It's a rare cause, but rarely the mother's immune system views the placenta as foreign tissue and she may reject that placenta. Now, the only reason I mention this is that this is one of the few uh, causes of a stillbirth that we can actually do something about. In the next pregnancy, we can actually give medications to immunosuppress the same thing we do with organ transplant patients. There are mothers who are kidney transplants. You know, they have kidneys in them that are transplants and we immunosuppress them naturally Pregnancy is a natural state of immunosuppression. So in those cases of this immune problem, we can give those women medications to decrease their response to the placenta. So that's a, sort of the big picture overview. I'd be happy, uh, and I see there are a lot of questions coming in to you know, answer anything particular that you might wanna point out, Samantha. Oh, we have so many questions coming in, but yeah, let's say like you, like you were saying, let's transition to COVID. So how is COVID? affecting pregnancies, how does it affect the placenta in particular? Because we've heard some pretty disturbing stories from moms who had um, both losses and, and, and thankfully live births. Um, but we've, we've literally heard from people that, you know, my, my, the doctor, my doctor delivered the placenta and it fell apart in their hands. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it looks like, Sam, there is one mom who is asking specifically about the Omicron variant. And I know that different variants, I mean, it's kind of hard to tell, but, you know, um, if you can speak to like specific variants. Yeah, I don't know if we have data on that, that would be really yeah. interesting. It's hard to know. So, you no, know, Harvey. <laughs> oh, yeah. So let me, let me give you what I know about. I mean, I'm lucky that at Yale, we were one of the places that looked at these cases very early. 
I was part of a research project where we looked specifically of how the placenta responds to um, the COVID infection, the SARS-CoV-2 virus specifically. Um, I would say here's the good news. Most women who do get COVID during their pregnancy, there is no consequence to the pregnancy, to the baby. Uh, that's the majority. It's, it's probably well over 95% if not even higher. An interesting ancillary study, just to sort of carry it through, that was done by one of my colleagues at Columbia University in New York, they looked at women who had COVID, didn't have COVID during this pandemic, and looked at the outcomes of the children at six months of age, their neurodevelopment, thinking, asking the question, could an infection of COVID, if it didn't cause any problems with the pregnancy, which as I said is, 95% of the time, uh, what happens to the children? It turns out the children are perfectly fine. There was no difference. However, this blew my mind, is that they compared those two groups to a control group from three years earlier, pre-pandemic, and they found there were significant differences between both of the children at six months, whether there was COVID or not in the pregnancy, compared to the three years earlier. So the pandemic is definitely having an effect on development of children, you know, being at home, mass, less social interactions and all that. So that turns out to be a much more serious issue than COVID. Now, I wanna just talk briefly about, unfortunately, the small percent of women, and we don't know why these women have this response, but I've had personally a number of cases I just, have one this week, in fact, it was very sad. The, a woman gets, you know, has a little sniffle, has a sore throat, loses her sense of smell. From the time the infection starts to the time that she has any sense or decreased fetal movement is a week. And then she goes in the hospital and there's a stillbirth. And these placentas are some of the most damaged placentas that I've ever seen. There is no way for the fetus to survive. This placenta is literally completely destroyed. There's no survivability in that case. It's just, it's not even the size of the placenta. It's just, there is no functional placenta left. Wow. The virus just completely rips it apart. Uh, we don't understand why some women, their pregnancies are impacted that way compared to the majority. So that's a mystery. And that's why I can't answer anything about variants because we don't understand even the basic question of why any type of, you know, SARS-CoV-2 virus does this in, for specific women or not. So, you know, we'll continue to look at this. There are a lot of really good immunologists who are studying this problem at a molecular level. I'm not one of those. I look at the placenta and, you know, maybe they'll come up with something, but I want to leave with the most important thing I can say about COVID. The most critical thing that a mother can do is become vaccinated. And if, you know, it's, and I'm a little concerned about vaccination within the first trimester. So let's assume at this point, anybody who is thinking about pregnancy, please, please become completely vaccinated. If you've already been vaccinated, get a booster before you get pregnant again, because the best way to prevent any complications is to not let your body even get the disease in the first place. I believe that there are some of um, that I, that there are some of the companies, uh, some of these companies who are making, um, sorry, words, uh, <laughs> who are trying to make a, another booster possible for uh, individuals over the age of 60 and, or maybe over 50, but at any rate, they might extend that further, I would imagine, for yeah, Pfizer I, or Moderna. Uh, for my personal take, I have my two Modernas and I have my one booster. And as soon as I'm able to get my second booster, I'm going to get it. And I would just recommend that everybody, you know, it's going to be like influenza. You know, we get a flu vaccine every year in the fall. We don't think about it. As long as this still exists and as long as these variants continue to circulate and we're going to have little mini waves, you know, we don't, I hope the next wave is a very mini wave. Uh, the best way to protect yourself is to uh, be vaccinated. And personally, if you're pregnant, I would, you know, wear a mask and I would minimize social contacts and don't expose yourself to situations that you can even get this virus. Again, understanding that 
luckily the majority of women getting this uh, disease will be okay, but you don't want to be that 5% group that has a loss because of COVID. All right, what else? Hit me with some questions. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna um, read you the next question, but first I'm gonna put a plug in for our change.org petition. Um, Cause right now we're over a thousand signatures and we would like to get 23 times that, one for every baby born still in the US every single year. Um, I dropped a link in the chat and there's also a link on our um, Instagram story, but we are asking ACOG to make placental measurements standard part of prenatal care because like Dr. Kleiman has said, we, can, we have a tool available to us now to identify placentas um, that are small, which is a risk factor for stillbirth. So we have tools to prevent babies dying now and we want to use them. But Fine. my question, yes. So you sign and get 23 people to sign. Everybody do that. Not my homework. Thank you. Please, please and thank you. <laughs> okay. So one of the questions in the chat, um, a mom said she recently had a stillbirth in December. It was her third pregnancy and both of her previous two pregnancies were healthy and full term. And she suddenly developed um, complications in the mid uh, second trimester. She never had any issues before. So she's wondering how can this happen to a healthy mom, a healthy pregnant person when it never happened before? And like many of us who were perfectly healthy and it happened to us. So please explain. Okay. The first thing, and I want to use this as a platform to respond to something that's underlying what I'm hearing that question. Women have to understand that these losses are not their fault. Okay. If there's only one thing you remember from this evening and you're out there listening and you've had a loss, it is not your fault. There's actually nothing that you can do to cause a loss, period. You can't bend over. You can't put the brakes too hard on your car. You can't have shoes that are too tight. You, I mean, I could go down the list of things I've heard over the 40 years I've been doing this. It's just unbelievable. I'm just going to summarize it. There's nothing that you can do to cause a loss, period. Okay. So now that you understand that, in terms of this particular question, what happened is not your fault. You didn't do it. There's nothing wrong with you. Okay. So we did a study looking at immunologic reactions of a mother against the pregnancy and preeclampsia and HELP syndrome is a form of immunologic reaction against the pregnancy. That's actually the basis of it. And it turns out we had a study where we looked at twins where they were different genetically twins. So a boy and a girl, let's say, the medical term is dizygotic or fraternal twins, non-identical twins. And one of the twins was being immunologically attacked by the mother and the other was not. So here is the same mother in the same uterus and the same incubator and the same blood and the same body, the same food that she's eating and her body, her immune system, her cells, which she doesn't control. No person can control your immune cells, but her immune cells decided that one placenta was foreign and the other was not. So the fact that you can have siblings where one is attacked and one isn't means that this can happen not at the same time, but at different times. So you can look at it this way. Those first two pregnancies were, you were lucky, whoever asked that question, this reaction didn't happen. Whatever the genetic trigger was in that third pregnancy somehow triggered that mother's immune system. Again, it's not her fault. It just has to do with the randomness, the, you know, roulette wheel of random genetics and what happened with those, that particular placenta. That's fascinating. You know, and this is one of the reasons why we always say every pregnancy is different, right? Every baby is different because every baby is an individual. You can't compare your pregnancy to your friends or your sisters or to, you know, some random guideline that they're trying to apply blanket to all, um, all pregnancies across the U.S., like 10 kicks of two hours. We know that's an outdated standard because again, every baby and every pregnancy is different. And this just goes to show that you can't even compare your pregnancy to your own previous pregnancies, right? Um, mm -hmm. Stuff, different stuff can happen. So it's so important to always be 
aware of what's normal for this baby in this pregnancy and to always speak up if you notice a change. But as Harvey said, you know, it is never a mom's fault. And one of the biggest problems we see in prenatal care today is that no one is giving that message to moms. No one is, no one is empowering moms to know what to look out for and how to, you know, speak up for themselves um, and, and to advocate for themselves and their babies. And half the time, unfortunately, we hear every single day from moms who are doing that effectively and being routinely dismissed by their medical providers. And it's infuriating and sadly, far too often results in a preventable loss. Um, so I'm so sorry for the, for that, what that mom has been through, but I hope like Harvey said that we, we can all take this to heart. I know all of us as lost moms have felt that guilt. Um, and- I'd like to just add one other comment about this case. And it, it really echoes what Erica talked about. So I want to emphasize it. Here's a woman who had two normal pregnancies, low risk, everybody's feeling comfortable. And just as Samantha said, here's a third pregnancy, which is different. If estimated placental volume measurements were routine in pregnancies, this issue would have been picked up before the stillbirth, no matter what the cause was, no matter how unexpected it was. You know, right now we're trying to get women who've already had a loss for a small placenta to have EPV. But my dream, I have a dream, is that EPV is done all the time and picks this up for all women, for all pregnancies, no matter what their previous pregnancy showed, no matter what the expectations were, uh, because the placenta is always smaller before the fetus has any problems and before she even has any symptoms of having this disease called preeclampsia. So I cannot emphasize why this is so important. And let's also say, we're not asking for a lot. This is not a frontal lobotomy of a fetus to analyze this, right? We're not taking blood from the umbilical cord, which is dangerous and which we do sometimes under you know, uh, serious medical conditions. But this is so simple. It's a 2D ultrasound technique. It's so easy that I taught an ultrasound tech to do this and she did it standing up on herself when she was 20 weeks pregnant. She said, well, let me see how easy this is. She was standing next to a machine. She put some gel on it, lifted up her shirt, did the estimated placental volume on herself. It turned out to be in the 80th percentile. So everything was good. And you know, if you can do it on yourself in 20 seconds, then anybody can do this for any woman, anytime. Absolutely. So Harvey, let's back up. Let's back up a little. For anybody who doesn't know, please explain what is EPV, estimated placental volume? How does it work? Um, yeah, what, what, what is it? Because we're seeing, again, there's lots of people in the chat who do know what it is. Um, someone here commented, doctors aren't doing it. They won't do the EPV. We have birthing people asking EPV and getting turned down. Um, and that is incredibly frustrating when you know what it is that you're asking for. So tell us, what, what are we asking for? Sure. So I just mentioned in a general way what the placenta is, the root system, but let's be more concrete about it. So in Europe, in some of the countries, the placenta, the word for it is called mother's cake. Again, it's a little misleading because they have the word mother. But I think if you think of a placenta, think of a big pancake. So if you have a really big skillet and you put the dough, you know, the batter in and you have, let's say, a pancake that's about one to two inches thick and maybe 12 inches in diameter, that's your placenta but it's flat, right, in the, in the pan. Now, when it's in the uterus, it's actually curved. It makes a shape, well, if I had a beanie cap on my head, you could use my head as a good example, it would be this curved structure, right? And that's the way it is inside the uterus. Oh, okay, you have to put it right in the middle. In front of your face, oh, there we go. It's my living son's placenta. Oh, well, it's, very cool. Yes. Oh, it's so cute. What a beautiful placenta. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Like we're but, an appetizing mother cake. But I will say, exactly. But I will say this, the problem with that picture is it still doesn't show what it's like inside the uterus, right? So it's this curved structure. So when I first was dealing with pregnancy losses because of small placentas, and I've been at Yale for 31 years, I went to my colleagues in maternal fetal medicine and said, hey, why aren't you measuring the placenta? You know, it's the cause the major cause of stillbirth. What's going on with you? And I said, well, it's too hard to measure. It's this curved structure. 
And unlike the length of a bone, for example, which is simple to measure by ultrasound, this curved structure is hard to measure. So I said, you know what? I was raised by a father who gave me math problems all the time. So I went back to my dad and I said, dad, I have a math problem for you. If you have this curved structure and you cut it right down the middle and you can imagine a crescent shape now, something like this, a crescent shape, this is the cross section of the placenta. If I give you the width measurement at the bottom, the height off the table and the thickness of my hand, for example, what is the equation that describes the three-dimensional volume of that you know, spherical cap? And he came up with the equation and I said, okay, now we have to test it. So we published this in 2010. So it's been 12 years since we've published this paper. But what that paper showed is that when we did the estimated placental volume measurement, EPV, right before delivery, and then weighed the placenta a few hours later after it was delivered, we found that the numbers were almost the same. So we proved that the mathematical equation was working. And since that time, we've collected over 2000 data points from six weeks to 42 weeks, let's say a pregnancy. And we've developed what are called normative curves. Just like, again, if you go to a pediatrician, they weigh your child and they say, your child's 75 pounds and is this age, they look at a chart to say, what is the percentile? We now have the percentile charts for EPV. And we've actually incorporated this into an app for the iPhone and for Android. So you can get it. It's called, well, it used to be called after my father's name, Merwin's Calculator, but now it's called, to make it easier, EPV Merwin's Calculator. So if you do a search for EPV on, on the, um, at least the iPhone store, I'm not 100% sure on the Google store at this moment, you will find the app and you could bring it to your doctor and say, look, please do this measurement and I can then calculate the percentile myself if you don't want to do it. So that's in summary of EPV, where it came from and what we do, how we get those measurements. And the other thing you should bring to your doctor too is if you go to pushpregnancy.org slash EPV or to measuretheplacenta.org, we have a printable flyer of five fast facts that explains everything that Dr. Harvey just said in uh, the front and back of the page. Um, so it's a great way to introduce your provider to EPV if they're not familiar with it. Um, and I see we're getting lots of questions in the mm -hmm. chat here about, you know, how, you know, uh, here's a mom said, I asked my MFM to measure my baby's placenta at my 20 week ultrasound. She denied saying they only measure the placenta in research protocols because there's not enough research evidence on what to do with the EPV measurement. Do you have advice on how to respond and continue to advocate for EPV? There's another mom who's at 12 weeks, it looks like, who is trying to figure out the best way to encourage her provider to do the same. Erica, do you have any thoughts? Did, were you able to get EPV measurements in your recent pregnancy? I have a lot of thoughts, but um, as someone who had a baby die because his placenta was too small, I still ran into obstacles in getting my providers to do EPV for my second pregnancy, even though we knew this is why my first son died. So I was already high risk because of that. I'm high risk again, because if you've had a stillbirth, you're like multiple times higher risk for another stillbirth. Um, this was during COVID. So um, yeah, five times higher risk. I mean, it should be enough that because I'm asking for it, but um, we ran into issues because during um, 2020, during COVID, um, some providers chose to do to not do um, procedures that they considered non-essential. And unfortunately, the closest provider that we could find was three hours away and they still, um, they wouldn't do that for me. So to, um, in the meantime, I didn't stop advocating for myself. I asked for extra monitoring in the form of twice weekly appointments. So they gave me, um, you know, biophysical profiles and non-stress tests, which aren't perfect. Um, and then I had, so I had multiple times during the week where I had eyes on my child. But what I did was I used um, Count the Kicks religiously to monitor my baby's movements because 
if there was going to be a change, I was going to speak up as soon as I felt a change because a change in movements can be sometimes the only warning sign and the an early warning sign that something is off. And in my case, long story short, my son slowed down at 36 weeks again, and I was able to report it. They monitored me, saw his heart rate was dropping, and they actually admitted me and delivered my son early. His placenta was not small yet but it had the same genetic abnormality present as my son who died. So we don't know what his placenta would have stopped growing. Was it shutting down? What We still don't know why he was in stress. So um, I would say if you can't get your provider to do this, ask them to, doc to document their refusal in your chart. Um, reach out to measure the placenta. We have our email on our website. We'll try to find a provider close to you who is doing um, placental measurements. You can try one of those boutique um, ultrasound places. Sometimes they will do it and you can download the, the data points in the app. And we're just asking, this is another piece of data that doctors can use to drive decisions, which is what they get paid to do. So this is just more information that they can use to assess the well-being of our children. Um, but everybody needs to count the kicks, regardless of your, if you're um, getting EPV done or not, so. Yeah, I, I can't agree more with, with that. And like you said, I mean, it's just so frustrating because the fact that you asked should be enough, right? Like mm -hmm. you, are, you are the customer here. You are the client when you're going to a doctor. Um, and if you are advocating for yourself and you're asking for additional information, I, I personally don't see any reason why you should ever be denied that, right? No one has, no one has ever once said, oh, we're going to measure your placenta. And if it's small, we're going to deliver right away, regardless of what gestation, right? No, we don't do that with anything in, in medicine or anything in life, right? That's not how people make decisions. You take in different data points and you evaluate, you know, this is risk stratification. This is something that obstetricians are very, very comfortable with. This is literally what they go to years and years of medical school to learn to do. This is what they're paid to do. So, you know, one of the things we always tell moms too is like, like Erica said, if you have, if you have the ability to, and again, this is something that, you know, you only get if you're privileged or you live in an area where there's a lot of doctors, you know, vote with your feet. Um, if your provider's not listening to you, whether it's about EPV or about anything else, like you deserve to be listened to. You, you're, you are the expert and the authority when it comes to your own pregnancy. Because like we said earlier, every baby and every pregnancy is different. So if you are saying that I need more information or I don't understand this or something doesn't feel right to me and you're not being heard, that is not okay. You need to find a doctor who is going to partner with you and treat you like a you know, a trusted and respected partner in this pregnancy, because that's what you should be. Um, the other thing I would mention in terms of advice is to make sure they know that this isn't like a totally random out of left field thing. So like uh, Dr. Joanne Stone, who is the president of the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine. So that's the head of all high risk pregnancy doctors in the United States uh, is doing this on every single one of her high risk rainbow clinic patients at the Mount Sinai Rainbow Clinic in New York City. Um, so these are parents who, as we mentioned earlier, who had a previous stillbirth and are five times the risk of having another stillbirth. And she has deemed it worthwhile to do an EPV on every single one of her patients. So if it's good enough for Joanne Stone, I don't understand why it's not good enough for every other doctor in the US. Again, this isn't the end all be all only tool, but stillbirth is a complex problem. And it's often the result of a perfect storm of factors. And if one of those, one of the very few factors in stillbirth that is easily identifiable is a small placenta. As Harvey mentioned earlier, it can literally be done in 30 seconds on any 2D ultrasound. Not a good ultrasound, not the like 3D ones, not the ones with the color, just the crappy 2D ultrasound. Any doctor can do it. Um, and again, and it's, it's an estimate, right? If you have, if your placenta is coming up and it's too big to measure, Clearly, it's not too small, right? Um, it doesn't have to be, it, it's not like if there's a 1% difference in, in how accurate it was that this is going to change the outcome of the pregnancy. It's like, no, it's just to give you an idea. If a mom is coming in and saying, my baby slowed down, something doesn't feel right, and all the other tests you're doing are coming back normal, don't send her home, keep her on the monitor, do an EPV. Maybe she's got a small placenta, you know, just like 
we have to listen to moms. That though, I love the CDC hashtag hear her campaign. Hear her. She's telling you something's not right. We have to listen to moms when they're saying it. And that that is the case too when it comes to asking your your doctor to measure your placenta. It's not that much to ask. Um, that kind of speaking of uh, complications and mom's concerns, there have been quite a few moms who have asked about, and parents, I guess, just in general, um, who have asked about steps to fix, to or well, things to address when a placenta is identified as small, um, and if they've had a previous loss as a result of a small placenta, things that they can do to, um, and I, I mean, I know that a lot of the structure of the placenta is genetically determined. So it, it would be kind of hard for them to change much about the placenta, but to prevent that from becoming an issue in a subsequent pregnancy. Well, that, that wraps up a whole bunch of questions that I'd like to sort of, I'm looking at some of the chat questions here. So I'll try to weave a bunch of things together. First of all, what we're talking about is changing a paradigm. This is estimated placental volume is not taught as a standard method right now, e either in residency or in fellowship for maternal fetal medicine people. So um, this is why we're getting pushback. That being said, medicine is advancing all the time. There are always new methods that need to be incorporated. And if the method is very simple and doesn't cause any harm and isn't a lot of extra work for people and they're already doing an ultrasound, from my point of view, it seems like, you know, this is something that should be relatively easy to do. Let me reply to some of the questions that I'm seeing related to this. One of the questions was, what do you do about a small placenta? So I think that's a really important thing. Samantha mentioned an important word before called risk stratification. First of all, no one would ever say, and I won't say, and that we don't advocate for this, that an estimated placental volume is going to be the single factor that determines the course of the pregnancy. It is one of the tools in the toolbox. We add all the information together at every moment of pregnancy to make a very simple decision, in or out. That is really a summary of obstetrics. I know it's obviously much more complicated, but from the point of view of what the obstetrician and the maternal fetal medicine and the nurse midwife, for example, are thinking about is, when do we deliver this baby? And if they have some extra information that helps them think about what to do, then why not have that data? Especially like Erica, somebody who's already had a loss because of a small placenta. Somebody asked, do women who have pregnancy losses like this have an increased chance of having one again? The answer is yes. They have a significant increased chance of having this happen again. So given that, and given that we know what the first cause is, they tend to have the same cause in the next loss, if they're gonna have a next loss for the same problem, why not use a simple tool that can tell us that it's happening already? Now, the other pushback I get all the time is, well, Harvey, you need to do a prospective randomized control trial to prove that this is effective. And first of all, there are ethical concerns. I am not comfortable in randomizing pregnant women and having half the group have no intervention when I know there's a small placenta and have them have stillbirths so I can prove to the world that what I'm saying is true, which I already know it's true. That's number one. Number two, I find it disingenuous to put so much pressure on us to prove EPV works when the standard method that most women get when they go into complaining of any problem is what's called a non-stress test. This is electronic fetal monitoring while a woman's lying down. They don't do anything. They just wait for the natural contractions of her uterus and they look at how the fetal heart rate responds. That's called a non-stress test. And I, I cannot tell you the countless number of lost moms who had a normal NST the day before they had their loss. Six hours, six hours before my daughter died. She okay, well, let's just say it right here. Um, for the world to hear. NST is a complete failure to predict stillbirth, period. I want to add one level of dimension in case anybody out there is saying, well, you don't really know that. Well, it turns out that electronic field monitoring was created at Yale University. And the person who did it is Ed Hahn. And I knew Ed Hahn when he was alive. And in the last lunch I had with him when he was visiting Yale, he was in his 90s at that point, 
he did this in the late 50s, this work, he said that electronic field monitoring was the worst thing he had ever done. It was a complete failure. This is the inventor of the method saying that it didn't work. And in fact, it's been shown it has no positive or negative predictive value. Just to show you how seriously flawed it is, you can have a fetus that has no brain. It's called anencephaly, and it has a perfectly normal electronic fetal monitor strip. Clearly, that's not telling us anything about brain activity when you look at an electronic fetal monitor strip. So maybe if you were lucky enough in cord compression, at the second you were doing the NST, you might see something. But it is, as a general rule, a total failure. However, since we started this whole evening saying the placenta is 100% the support system for the fetus, it seems pretty obvious to me that we should know how big it is, right? And if it's certainly very small and the ratio between the fetus and the placenta is very bad, that's a problem. I have many maternal fetal medicine colleagues of mine who don't understand this very simple point that you can have a normal size fetus slash baby with an extremely small placenta. In fact, those are the worst situations because that ratio, now we have an 18 wheeler truck with a little lawnmower engine, that's what causes the stillbirth is having that big difference. They're following the fetus saying, I was trained, look at the word, maternal fetal medicine. They're following the fetus and they're saying, I'm following the fetus, I'm doing all these tests on the fetus, everything seems okay. Yeah, it's okay right up until the time that the gas tank runs out of gas and then the car stops. That's what happens with stillbirth with small placentas. So you can tell I'm pretty passionate about this and also annoyed really that my colleagues are finding it so difficult to add this to their repertoire. That being said, changing medical practice is a big challenge and we are still stepping up to the plate we are still designing studies. We're prospectively looking at populations. We, we're not not doing things, but I find it very frustrating that people are unwilling, especially with a mother who's already had a loss for a small placenta, like Erica. I worked with her to try to find a provider for her, and it was just unbelievably difficult. I was so disappointed in my colleagues for not helping on a humane, compassionate level this woman who has already had a loss because of a small placenta, I really find that a sad statement. Yeah. So like, just, even if you don't think it's going to work, right? Even if like, if it will just give a mom who's pregnant after a loss and, you know, extremely anxious, some measure of comfort, like just do it. Like, is it that much to ask? We hear this all the time too. Even moms who had cord, ac cord accidents and are asking for their cords to be um, the cords to be imaged and like, yes, that's much more challenging to do than measuring the placenta, but there are doctors out there who can, who can, who can do it if they're trained to. And most doctors don't even want to attempt to learn. And they say, well, what am I going to do if I see something wrong? And, you know, our friend, our friend, Laura, um, Laura Fora had a, a beautiful quote when uh, she was recording videos for the New York City Rainbow Clinic training. She says, well, I think to any lost mom, the answer there is very clear. We're going to, we're going to watch this baby and we're going to make sure that they make it out alive. Like that's all we're asking for. No one's asking, no one's asking for miracles. Like we just want to know that everything possible is being done to get our babies here safely. And I think that every family deserves that, especially every family who's already lost a child to a potentially preventable cause. Like that's just basic human decency. I don't understand um, why this is so hard. So yeah, somebody asked, asked in the in the chat, you know, um, again, a, a mom who had trouble, you know, requested EPB in her pregnancy after loss and the tech said, this is never, never heard of it, this isn't done, this isn't obviously true. So what's being done to spread the word, get the text trained and updating protocol so the standard measurement is taken. So um, Erica, do you want to share about the Hey ACOG Measure the Placenta campaign? Oh, oh God, I should get yes. back. I got a stack. These, these are a couple of my letters that got sent back. <laughs> um, we have a letter mailing campaign um, that for Measure the Placenta, which we're a group of lost parents who are um, advocating for change in prenatal care. And we have a letter mailing campaign that we would love for anyone to be a part of if you want to help us from the ground up. So we have people working from the top down and we need parents and families to help us work from the bottom up to to reach ACOG and 
You could sign up on our Measure the Placenta website and we have a letter already written. You could just print it off, put in your personal story. And we have a list of addresses of members of ACOG that we are um, communicating with to tell them why this change needs to happen in prenatal care. And um, to date, we've sent thousands, over a thousand letters. Um, yeah, a lot of letters. Uh, I'm sorry, you cut out a little bit, but we've sent a lot of letters and there's like hundreds of parents who are part of this and the more the better because they're starting to take notice and Sam has been in part been a part of meetings with ACOG leadership and um, they're starting to pay attention to us. Yes, yes, it's, it's working. So please, um, please, if you have if you have the means. Uh, join us in the campaign. If it's too much to send letters, please, as Erica mentioned earlier, go to change.org and sign the petition. Ask your friends and family to sign the petition. Um, we're trying to get to 23,000 signatures. And what that letter says is um, to ACOG, who is the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, they set all the standards of care for every pregnancy in the United States. We're saying, number one, you need to make stillbirth prevention a priority because enough is enough. Number two, we have a tool, EPV, that can save potentially 4,000 small placenta stillbirths a year. And we need this to be put in a standard practice. Um, number three, at the very, we understand you want more research. Tell us what, you, what kind of research you want to see, and we will make it happen. We literally have parents standing at the ready, ready to fund whatever research is necessary to make this happen. Because this is, again, such a simple, easy ask. Um, number three, if there is, if you have moms or families, any birthing person who is pregnant and after a loss and is specifically asking for EPV, do whatever's necessary to clear the way for them to do that. Because we hear again from too many people, too many obese today, even ones who are interested in doing EPV that, well, I can't do that until ACOG tells me I can. Um, and the reason for that is because honestly, they're afraid of getting sued and they should be. Um, because that is how obstetricians get, get legal protection is by following the same standard of care of all their peers, even if that standard of care is not the best standard of care. Um, so it's a really unfortunate situation that we're in in this country. Um, but yeah, it really, it really takes courage. It takes courage to do the right thing here. And that's what we're calling for. We're calling for doctors to, you know, be on the, be on the patient's side. You know, we, we need you guys. We need you guys. We need your help. We need you to help make sure that families can get the care that they deserve. And at the very least, um, if, if a parent who's already had a small placenta stillbirth is asking, we need them to be able to get that care. Um, so that's what the letter says. And you can just sign it, mail it out. We'll give you the addresses. It's going to all the people who are on the committee who make the standards of care um, to ask them for their help. Let me, let me jump in here, Samantha, a couple things. I see a couple of questions I want to roll up as best I can. First of all, I changed my name uh, so you can see it to my email, harvey.climate at yale.edu. If your question was not answered or you're listening to this later, please email me. And I, will, I answer all emails from all patients all the time. That's number one. So a couple of questions are flowing through here, the chat. One is, can you make a placenta bigger? No, there's really nothing you can do. The only thing you can do, which is good for a healthy pregnancy in general, is drink plenty of water and fluids, okay? And how do you know if you're drinking enough? I have a very simple test for this, the color of your urine. If you pee in a toilet and it looks yellow, you're not drinking enough right? It should be clear. I'm sorry if it means you have to go to the bathroom a lot, but that's just the price to pay. Think of yourself as the watering can and your baby as a, you know, plant in a little pot and you need to water that all the time. So that's one of the things you can choose to do. Now, in terms of, so that's the answer about a healthy placenta. What about biophysical profile? What about these other tests? Well, biophysical profile is an ultrasound test of five parameters, four or five, depending on how they do it, of how the fetus is doing. And I've said to you already that placentas are so efficient that even when they're small, before they finally give out altogether, right, when the gas is out of the tank, that placenta will keep that fetus alive and healthy to the very end. And they can be in the 75th percentile 
Now you don't get a 75th percentile weight, you know, baby inside of a mother unless the placenta is doing an amazing job. However, if the placenta is in the 0.1 percentile and the baby is in the 75th percentile inside the mother, that's such a difference that eventually as that baby tries to get bigger and bigger, that placenta just cannot support it. So we want to know before there's a loss that there is that disparity between the two, which is why whenever I have a lost family that I talk to, and as an aside, if I were to examine the placenta from your loss, and I, we have a whole system for doing that on my Yale website, which if you email me, I will send you that information. I also offer an opportunity to meet with me by a Zoom conference during my clinic. And one of the things that we'll talk about is what things that you can do with your doctor to try to encourage this to be done better in terms of you know, EPV and things like that. So um, I think I've wrapped up quite a few things. So biophysical profile, the reason that's not as effective as it should be is that it's still looking at the fetus. Now, one person had a question, can a small placenta increase the likelihood of abruption? Let me drill down a little bit. I've just been mentioning small placentas, but let me explain why placentas are small. There are three reasons. The most common is a genetic abnormality. There's nothing we can do about that. That's just the luck of the dice in terms of the egg and the sperm. That's about half the time. Another big chunk is decreased maternal blood flow to the placenta. Now, a lot of times that's due to immunologic issues, and we can help a little bit in that area by giving aspirin starting at 12 weeks of pregnancy, which increases blood flow to the placenta, drinking lots of fluids, as I said, and also keeping track of the size of the placenta. And then the last reason for a small placenta is this immunologic rejection. If that's the reason I said at the beginning of this um, session, we can do immunosuppression. There's something called prednisone that we give to people with arthritis, for example. We can give low doses of that and that can help out sometimes also. So that's one of the reasons I'm gonna give a pitch is that if, and again, my deepest condolences for anybody who's had a loss, but I think the most important thing you can do after a loss is try to figure out why the loss occurred. So we can talk about to the doctors what we do next time. So again, if your local pathology department at the hospital, wherever the loss is, doesn't really have an explanation or is insure, again, insurance covers this virtually all the time. Please email me, we'll send you the information about how to get slides from your placenta. You might think, well, the placenta is still around. The placenta isn't around. But if it was sent to pathology, the slides are available for years after that delivery. And I've looked at cases 24 years after the fact and still been able to figure out what happened in cases. So please email me if you wanna understand why you had a loss, if you're currently pregnant, concerned about your future pregnancy, anything, I'll be happy to help you. Thank you, Harvey. And there's more information about that process and, and how to reach out to Dr. Harvey on, on our PUSH website, pushpregnancy.org slash answers, uh, kind of outlines what to expect. And as Dr. Harvey said, um, it is typically covered by insurance and, and your placenta, your baby's placenta should have been sent to pathology if you had a stillbirth. That's generally routinely done. So um, it's, worth, it's worth a shot. And for many of us, like for me, for example, I was told I had a cord accident um, and I believed that for many years until I randomly sat next to Harvey at a conference and he asked if I knew what caused my stillbirth and, and I decided to send him my slides just basically for fun because I knew that it would be covered by insurance. And, uh, and lo and behold, he found new information that completely changed um, everything that I knew about my daughter's death and what caused it and, and my own role in it. And um, as Harvey said, you know, relieved all of that that guilt that I had been carrying for so long thinking that I must have done something to cause this. So um, we definitely, definitely highly recommend that you at least look into it. Um, the other things we wanted to mention were uh, we have coming up in October and, and uh, Dr. Harvey will be there and all of us will be there and we hope that you will join us uh, in DC on uh, October 15th. We are going to be pushing 23,000 empty strollers to pass the steps of Congress to call for change. Um, this event is called the Big Push to End Preventable Stillbirth, and you can find more information at 
thebigpushmarch.org. Um, it is totally free. Uh, obviously, you got to find your way to DC. Um, but we we really this would be the first event of its kind ever, um, the first large scale demonstration um, in support of ending preventable stillbirth. And we've got a fantastic coalition of organizations um, across the maternal, fetal, and infant health space um, who have joined together with us to call for change. Um, one of the things that we're asking for is for our representatives to pass a bunch of historic bills um, that are currently active in Congress. Uh, this includes the Shine for Autumn Act, hashtag Shine for Autumn, um, or Shine for Stillbirth. Uh, and and the, Shine, the Shine Act is really exciting because it improves data collection, uh, trying to make sure that families who suffer a loss get the answers they deserve. Um, and one of the things it includes is funding to create more Harvey Climans um, to train, train a whole new generation of uh, placental pathologists to do what Harvey does. Um, to make sure, again, that families are getting the answers that they deserve and that we are getting the data and the research that we need in order to push, push progress forward. Um, the other act that's really exciting um, and was spearheaded by our friends at Healthy Birthday who created the Count the Kicks program is the uh, Maternal and Child Stillbirth Prevention Act of 2022. And what this is, is a um, it's a, a very a small amendment to the Title V Maternal and Child Health Act. This is funding that goes from the federal government to the states um, to do anything that would improve outcomes for, for um, parents and babies. And right now those funds can be spent on stillbirth, but nobody knows it because it doesn't say the word stillbirth anywhere in Title V. So this is a very simple change. Um, what's really exciting about both of these bills is that they are bipartisan. Uh, the SHINE Act is being um, sponsored in the Senate by Cory Booker and Marco Rubio um, because stillbirth affects everyone and everyone should care about it. And, and sadly, no one is safe from it. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention is I know we got so many, so many amazing questions in the chat uh, and I'm sorry we couldn't get them all tonight. Harvey, thank you again for putting your email address out there. Please don't hesitate to follow up with our, Harvey. The other thing I wanted to mention is that we do this every month. Uh, the first Wednesday of every month on Clubhouse in our Empowered Pregnancy Club um, on the Clubhouse app. Uh, there's a link from our website um, and you can join us. And in, the thing that's cool about Clubhouse is it's audio only. Uh, so it's almost like you know, listening to a radio show and anybody can come on stage and ask questions. You can send us questions in the back channel. So it's another way to kind of um, access Harvey's expertise uh, once a month in a, in a nice informal kind of setting. Um, so we hope you'll join us there too. Uh, Angelica, Erica, is there anything else I forgot that we should be mentioning? I think we did about as good as we could with, with the amount of time that we had. Um, I really appreciate everything that you that you do for us, uh, both of you ladies, and then of course, Dr. Dr. Kleiman, you are amazing. We appreciate your time. It's my honor, my honor to help in such a difficult time for so many families. I just want to say for all of the healthcare providers listening to please not forget that it's not just something that happens, it affects families like mine. And we have tools now to end preventable stillbirth. And we have amazing doctors like Dr. Kleiman, Dr. Stone, Dr. Rad, Dr. Florescu, who are already doing this. And everyone else can be doing it too. And we can help end this crisis that is killing 23,000 babies a year. Here, here. It's time. Here, here. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, the recording will be available on Facebook. And again, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to our, to our PUSH team or Metro the Placenta or Count the Kicks with any questions that you have um, about how to have an empowered pregnancy and how to advocate for yourself. Uh, thank you all so much. Thank you, especially again, Dr. Kleiman, Erica, and Angelica for joining us tonight. Shout out to our co-director of awareness, Anna Vick, who has been helping us with the questions in the chat tonight. And looking forward to seeing you guys all in Clubhouse uh, in a couple of weeks. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>